I'm not going to be retelling Homer's Iliad. You already know that story. But there is something about the Iliad that I want to point out, and that's in chapter 2 of the Iliad. Sometimes it's called the Catalog of Ships. And this is the list of uh, people that uh, went to war against Troy, where they came from, and how many ships that particular location sent. Now this turns out to be particularly accurate. Something that many people say could only have come about if Homer were making reference to an actual existing Mycenaean document of some kind. In the catalog, Homer mentions 164 places that sent ships. Now 96 of those can be identified and three quarters of those that were identified do show Mycenaean occupation. In fact, uh, in the early 1960s, uh, there were some archaeologists, an uh, R. Hope Simpson and John Francis Lazenby, who surveyed the sites mentioned in the Homer's catalog, and they concluded, and this is a quote, there is not a single place mentioned in the catalog which cannot be shown to have been inhabited in the Mycenaean period. Of those which have been excavated, none so far have failed to produce the evidence of Mycenaean occupation. Some of these Mycenaean sites were so thoroughly abandoned that the classical Greeks knew nothing about them. Furthermore, sites that uh, in Mycenaean times were important, but in classical times weren't, uh, those sent large numbers of ships, and the uh, classical Greeks could never have guessed that relationship. Finally, names that you find in the Iliad can also be found in Mycenaean Linear B tablets, including Ajax, Achilles, Hector, and Orestes. One final comment now about the size of the force. In those days, the common ship that was used by the Greeks was the Pentaconter, or 50er, so-called because it had 50 people on board. And there were over a thousand ships in the catalog. So if you just multiply 50 by a thousand, you get a Greek army of about 50,000. Now, seeing as though Achilles uh, supplied his Myrmidons with a number of uh, ships, 50 ships, you can guess the Myrmidons were at about 2,500. Now, where was Troy? Uh, Troy was in the northwest corner of what is now Turkey, or Anatolia, if you will. And this turns out to be a particularly good place to put a city. Troy was almost certainly placed where it was for three reasons. First of all, we know that there was a big wool industry there. Secondly, we know that horses were being raised there. But the most important reason may very well have to do with commerce. Troy is located very close to the Dardanelles. Now that's the transit between the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. The Dardanelles used to be called the Hellespont. Now the Hellespont is a fairly narrow passage and so is the Bosphorus. Those are the two choke points to get from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. The Bosphorus is the site of Istanbul today, and the uh, other site, uh, that's where Troy was on the Dardanelles. These days, the Dardanelles is primarily a ferry crossing point between Europe and Asia. Mostly, it's tourists going from Istanbul to, uh, to Troy, I think. But all commercial shipping going from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea has to pass through here. Today that includes things like oil tankers, but that was equally true in Homer's time. Grain ships primarily would have been the most sensitive thing going through those straits. In ancient times you needed favorable winds to get through the straits, and in case there were unfavorable winds you'd probably have to hold up at the harbor where Troy was located. Today the Trojan Bay is completely silted up. This uh, map will show you what it used to look like at about the time of the Siege of Troy, and the dotted white line is the present coastline. We are on Hiserlik now, which is the mound that uh, Troy is, was built on. 
in the distance there, that low-lying flat field, that's where the bay was. One of the things that Homer says about uh, Troy is that the wind blew strongly there, and that's still true today. Now, if you ask the average person who discovered Troy, they're likely to say Heinrich Schliemann. This is not strictly correct, however. When Heinrich Schliemann got to the area of Troy in search of the city, he didn't have the foggiest idea where it was, so he started asking around. And he ran into a Frank Calvert, who was the uh, U.S. Consul. And Frank Calvert actually put him on to, uh, to Hisserlich as the site. Incidentally, this wall that we're looking at right now could very well date from the time of the Trojan War. It's possible that Patroclus or uh, even Achilles tried to climb this wall. Anyway, back to Schliemann. So why isn't uh, Frank Calvert uh, generally considered to be the discoverer of Troy? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that Frank Calvert didn't have many resources and he wasn't able to do very much. On the other hand, Heinrich Schliemann was rich. He had made his money in the gold rush out in California. The result was that Frank Calvert couldn't afford to hire folks to help him, but Schliemann could hire gangs of people to clear away dirt and to uh, move things about. Now to the average person, the uh, sort of thing that you see here for the most part looks like it's just a jumble of rocks. And that certainly must be the way that uh, Schliemann originally thought of it. His going in position was that the, uh, the city of Achilles and Hector and Priam, <clears throat> that that would be the lowest city, the one furthest down. He expected cities to have been built on top of it, but the city at the base he expected to be the city of the Iliad. So Schliemann started right away to dig a big ditch all the way through the mountain in order to get to the lowest possible level. In doing so, he obliterated all the evidence of the layers in between. Schliemann discovered a complex site of nine different levels, some of which were more recent than Troy, but many of which were far earlier. By cutting the trench the way he did, Schliemann may very well have made it impossible to absolutely prove that this is the site of Troy. It now turns out that the site uh, goes back to probably about 3000 BC and uh, Troy 1 through Troy 5 levels uh, basically bring it up to about 1700 BC. Now at that point uh, there's a new culture that takes hold at Troy 6 and this population is Indo-European related to the Mycenaeans and it may very well be the city of the Iliad. <laughs> Troy 6 begins about 1700 BC and continues to about 1250 BC roughly the date of the siege of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann was an amateur archaeologist but he was fortunately followed by two professional archaeologists, Carl Blagan and Brookfeld. So we Brookfeld. walked around this to see this part of the fortification wall. After a fire that badly damaged what they found out. So let's walk around this and then see it, how it was done. Now many tourists have been uh, visiting uh, Troy over the years. Some of them you may even recognize their names. On his way into Greece, Xerxes stopped by here, vowing that his invasion of Greece was in part a vengeance for what happened at Troy. He sacrificed a thousand oxen here and probably put on quite a uh, barbecue for the army. Alexander the Great uh, paid a visit to Troy going the opposite direction, uh, destroying the Persian uh, Empire. And uh, he is said to have left his armor there in exchange for Achilles' armor, which he was supposed to have uh, worn in battles. Julius Caesar uh, dropped by on his uh, cultural tour of, of this area as a child. The Fourth Crusade Crusaders uh, also claimed that uh, their activities were uh, in part a result of vengeance for uh, Troy, 
and uh, Mehmet the, the second said the same thing. Everyone from Xerxes to Metmec the second seems to have visited this particular location and known that this location was in fact the site of Homer's Iliad, the Troy. They say that uh, Heinrich Schliemann uh, discovered Troy. Actually, that's not true. Troy was never lost. Alexander was here. Julius Caesar was here. It was not really lost. It was just misplaced. Schliemann did claim to make one fantastic discovery at Troy, though. Uh, very close to where the uh, ramp is that you're just about ready to see, he dug up what he called Priam's treasure. This turned out to be one of the most fantastic gold treasures ever found by any archaeologist anywhere at any time. Schliemann quickly uh, spirited the uh, gold out of uh, Turkey and uh, on, uh, on its way towards Berlin he uh, had his wife Sophie dress up in it and uh, had a photo op. Uh, the material made it into Berlin and then at the end of World War II this material disappeared and its existence was not certain for a very long time. What we now know is that in the closing days of World War II, the Russians grabbed these artifacts, in part because the Nazis had been stealing uh, treasure from uh, Soviet museums. But uh, the point is that they grabbed it, they brought it back to uh, Moscow, and they didn't disclose to the world what happened to it. We now know that it's been in the Pushkin Museum all this time. The result is that uh, Turkey and its museums have only a remnant of uh, the precious metal that was uh, said to have been located in Troy. And I say said to have been located in Troy for a good reason. Heinrich Schliemann was a known liar. The fact of the matter is uh, he said that Sophie was there helping him uh, with the uh, discovery and we know for a fact that Sophie wasn't even in the country at the time. Uh, the result is it's entirely possible that Schliemann had bought this uh, material and had planted it himself and made up the whole story. Here's something I just had to show you. Uh, Homer's Iliad makes reference to a boar's tusk helmet and uh, for a very long time none had been found but a few decades ago someone discovered an actual boar's tusk helmet and this is what it looks like. So what did Troy look like? Well I've got a, a number of possible uh, uh, depictions of, uh, of Troy and, and generally what it looked like. Uh, this is a standard uh, Hittite uh, gate, uh, city wall and towers and uh, the Trojans probably used something very similar to that. Now the problem, or one of the problems that Schliemann had, and uh, Carl Blagan and Dorpfeld for as far as that goes, uh, is that Troy is extremely small. It's only recently that the current uh, excavation team, the Tubing and Cincinnati team, has come up with a lower city to add to the size of Troy to make it a formidable site. What you're looking at is only the citadel that Schliemann found. It's that little uh, yellow space on this particular chart. However, the Tubing and Cincinnati team found a much larger lower city. It's encircled in red. A defensive perimeter well outside the city walls. This would make Homer's Troy several times larger than previously thought. Suddenly, Troy wasn't so small. Suddenly, Troy was looking much more defensible. In order to attack the city, you would have had to have disembarked from your chariot, gone into and out of the ditch, all the while dodging arrows that were being shot at you by Trojans who were behind a wall not far in the distance. You then had to scale that wall, run through the lower city, that's 1,200 feet. Another thing that has always been to archaeologists is that there's very little sign of warfare at Troy. Yes, certainly there is destruction and there is fire. But there's very little indication of actual warfare. 
segment pages on? Arrowheads, used by ancient warriors in this very city. Finally, a connection to a military destruction of Homer's Troy. Okay, I'm back. Schliemann proved there was a Troy. Carl Blegen showed it was besieged, burned, and destroyed. The Tubing and Cincinnati team found that Troy was a large city subject to a military attack. But can we say that the Trojan War, the subject of Homer's life's work, and Schliemann's obsession really took place? So I think there was a Trojan War. We have circumstantial evidence that the Mycenaeans are fighting in northwest Anatolia as early as the 15th century, perhaps 300 years before the so-called Trojan War. wars between the Greeks and the Trojans. It certainly wouldn't be surprising because Troy is located in this border region where the Greeks and the Hittites continually um, sought control. And so Troy was an attractive uh, target for both sides. Certainly there were wars. We have the archaeological evidence for it. Wait a second. The only evidence that he has is a couple of bronze arrowheads now, they try to explain that away by saying that bronze was very valuable and after the battle, people would go around and police up the arrowhead so that they could be reused. Okay, that makes sense. But that doesn't prove that there was a battle here. The only thing that we really have is charred ruins. We know that there was a fire. We know that there was earthquake-like destruction. Now, we really have to look for other evidence, for other literature for other sources to prove that this war actually took place. 